dive back in. Um, so while you were uh, gone, I drew some A values and put them in this table. You don't need to scramble to get them down. Uh, it, in a lot of ways, this is sort of what you would expect. Um, so for hydrocarbon type groups, uh, the A values increase, but not perhaps uh, in the way you might think. For example, going from an ethyl group, going to an ethyl group from a methyl group, you might think, well, I'm doubling that in size. Uh, nevertheless, the A value doesn't go up by a lot. And the reason for that is that uh, if I go to the ethyl group, that's kind of an ugly chair. Uh, remember, remember that the OH group could rotate the hydrogen out of the way. Uh, the ethyl group can put the new methyl group out here instead of in here, and so the system feels it less. Does that make, does that make sense? We can, you can get that other methyl group out of the way. And so it's, it's, it's not any more bad to have the ethyl group axial than it is to have the uh, methyl group axial. If you start replacing hydrogens with other methyl groups, as is the case here for this isopropyl substituent, the A value starts to increase because it's no longer, you, you no longer have to just get one methyl group out of the way, you've got to get two. Uh, but then it jumps up quite a bit more again once you put a T-butyl group on there because now there's no getting the methyl group out of the way. Uh, but this is just useful as a rule of thumb for organic chemistry about size, sterics, how easy it is to get close to a group. T-butyl is very large. Uh, isopropyl is less large. Ethyl is even less. Methyl is even less. Um, I will point out that, remember, in terms of kcals per mole, every 1.3 kilocalorie per mole difference is a factor of 10 in equilibrium constant at room temperature. And so uh, you might expect for methyl, the methyl substituent, if you were to measure the equilibrium between having methyl axial versus methyl equatorial, um, you're probably going to have something like uh, a little bit greater than 90% equatorial and maybe a little bit less than 10% axial, right? I'm just sort of ballparking that because I know 1.4 is a factor of 10, so 10 to 1, uh, but this is 1.7, so it's going to be a little bit better than that. Um, in contrast, for the T-butyl group, uh, you've now got, I don't know, divide 5.5 by 1.4, and you get a number that's somewhere between 3 and 4-ish, right? Um, and what that means is, for the T-butyl group, equatorial versus axial, oops, just to draw it like this, Equatorial versus axial is like 99.9, let's see, three orders of magnitude. So is that the thousandths place-ish? And maybe 0.1% uh, of having the group axial. So um, anyway, you can sort of put these numbers in context. Uh, the halides are an interesting bunch because... Uh, as you go down a row of the periodic, down a column of the periodic table, size increases. Nevertheless, what you see here is once you get to chlorine, the A value doesn't change very much. What's the reason for that? Uh, well, as size of these atoms increases, so does bond length. And remember, the key problem we're trying to avoid with axial versus equatorial are first having the axial group gauche to the ring, and second, those 1-3 diaxial interactions. Both of those should be less problematic if the bond between the ring and whatever the substituent is gets longer. Um, so let me try to illustrate this in Spartan. Um, we'll come back here and we're going to delete some stuff. Let's put chloro here. Okay, 
and I want you to compare that situation with the situation where it's fluoro instead. Do you see how much shorter that bond is? Oh, that's kind of interesting. I don't know why that is. The calculations are telling us it's actually a little bit better to have fluoroaxial for reasons I don't understand. Oh, yeah, I do. It's hyperconjugation. <laughs> um, all right, but fluoro is small. Put chloro there. You see the bond is longer. Let's put bromo there. And the bond is even longer. Okay. Um, and all of these numbers are less than... Uh, all of these numbers are, are uh, less than 1.3. And so there's somewhere between a one-to-one -one mixture of axial versus equatorial here to slightly biased in favor of uh, equatorial. But what you can see is that as the bonds get longer, even if the atom gets bigger, it doesn't matter so much. Yes? So the A values are comparing the axial to the equatorial. That's right. Great question. So how do you compare different cyclohexanes that have different groups at attached? Are all of them, are all the equatorial conformations equal? No, probably not. Am I going to give you a dif different cyclohexanes and say which, which equatorial conformation is more favorable where you're only changing the one group? I don't think so. Yeah. All right. So with these sort of qualitative values in mind, we can start to uh, answer some questions, uh, and it becomes easier to do uh, even more substituted cyclohexane rings. So let's put a methyl group here. Let's put a bromo group there, and then over here, I don't know, let's put a T-butyl group. So I'm going to just start numbering somewhere. Doesn't really matter where. Uh, I'm not attempting to do anything with IUPAC numbering. I'm going to start with carbon 1 at an up carbon, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. At carbon one, I have in the in the overhead view the T butyl group is coming going away from me, so that's down. In my chair view, up is here, down is here, so the T butyl group would have to be down axial. Would it, would it be on the one carbon? Oh, uh, so no. yep. Sorry. Thank you. Down equatorial. Sorry, I was thinking I had numbered this one somehow. I, anyway, we all good with the T-butyl group equatorial down. Sorry. Um, carbon 4 has a methyl group that's up. At this position, the up position is equatorial. And then at carbon 5, we have an up bromo group. The up position there is axial. So this is chair confirmation one. And now we'll ask, what if we do chair confirmation two? Now let's put one at a down carbon instead of an up carbon, but let's continue to go around the ring in the same clockwise sense. Now down T-butyl group should be down axial. Now up methyl group on carbon 4 should be up axial, but up bromo group on carbon 5 would be equatorial. All right, so this one may be a no-brainer. Which confirmation do you think is better? Chair confirmation 1. Itty bitty little arrow. Probably, you know, greater than 99.9%. .9%. Uh, the A value, and how can you tell that? Well, you know the A value for bromo says it's not as bad to have bromo axial 
as it is to have methyl and t-butyl axial. So, you know, I could add numbers together. I could say, okay, 5.5 plus 1.7, that's like 7.2 destabilization to be here versus, uh, versus uh, like 0.4 destabilization to have the axial group uh, be bromo. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is it's clear that these two equatorial substituents outweigh the penalty for having the bromo group axial. Okay? All right, so I'll be able to do that. Now I'm going to disclose one of my, uh, I hate to do this, but I'm going to disclose one of my evil types of questions on the exam. Uh, somebody earlier mentioned carbohydrates, and so what I'm going to draw for you is actually a carbohydrate. I don't know what its name is actually right now. But it is a six-membered ring with a whole ton of substituents. Okay. And, um, of course, there are only two chairs for any six-membered ring. So if you have a question with options A through, like, J, that means all of them but two aren't even the right molecule. So part of this question is not just memorizing that, oh, if everything's equatorial, that's good. Uh-uh. Because you got to make sure you draw the right molecule before you even worry about whether it's the best chair. Okay? Man, I've never disclosed that to everybody about how all of the answers but two are bogus. Right? Not even the right molecule. Actually, that's an unintelligent statement. On a multiple choice exam, all of the answers but one are bogus, ideally, right? <laughs> so you already knew that. Um, but beware, because there are going to be some options that look good, but they're not even the right molecule. So uh, it doesn't matter where. Start your numbering somewhere. I'm going to choose with the oxygen. Then draw a chair. This is why on these types of questions, I totally recommend that you actually write out your answer uh, uh, on paper rather than just try out all of the options. So I've chosen to put the oxygen at an up position. I might have also chosen to put the oxygen at a down position. Uh, both of those are possibilities. And in fact, if I fill in the groups here, that's going to be chair one. And if I fill in the groups here, that's going to be chair two. But before I even worry about that, I need to number the ring, and I'm going to make sure I go around the ring in the same direction, clockwise. Um, now that I've established that, I go atom by atom, and I put the substituents in the appropriate place, making sure to preserve the down and upness of each substituent. So on carbon-2, the OH group is down. My down position on carbon-2 is axial. At this point, some of you are thinking, but I thought you said axial was bad. It doesn't matter yet. we got to draw the right molecule, and then we can worry about the conformation that puts the most biggest stuff equatorial versus axial. All right, carbon-3 OH group is down. So on carbon-3, the down position is down equatorial. On carbon-4, the OH group is up. At carbon-4, the up position is equatorial. On carbon-5, the OH group is up. At carbon-5, the up position is axial. On carbon-6, this CH2OH group is up. The up position on carbon-6 is equatorial. See how we did that? It's not bad if you just go through it systematically step by step. So work on that process until it becomes second nature. Now if I go over here to the other chair, one, two, three, four, five, and six, now uh, I've still got to keep everything that was down, down, and everything that was up, up. But on carbon two, where the OH group was down axial, now it's going to be down equatorial. Don't like that line. 
On carbon-3, where the OH group was down equatorial, it's going to be down axial. On 4, where the OH group was up equatorial, it's going to be up axial. On carbon-5, where the OH group in the chair number 1 was axial up, it's now going to be equatorial up. And then finally, on carbon-6, where the CH2OH group was equatorial up, it's now going to be axial up. Okay, so now I can ask, and I want to go and confirm, you know, at least a couple of times that I've gotten the up-down stereochemical relationships the right way. Um, so take, take a look at that and consider which one of these would be better. What do you think? Chair one, okay, why? All right, the CH2OH has likely got an A value that's, you know, somewhere close to like an ethyl group. Perhaps, perhaps it's just kind of exactly like these. OH group has an A value of one. So if I look at chair number one, I have one, two OH groups equatorial, two axial, that would tend to offset each other evenly, right? But I have the big methyl group or the big CH2OH group equatorial. Over here, again, I have two OH groups equatorial, two axial, so not much difference there. But the methyl group is up axial here, and that should have a, a penalty of, of about 1.7 kilocalories per mole. So, yes, indeed, this is the most stable chair. Um, if you care, this is alpha D galactopyranos. You won't hear those words again until 352. Unless I say them again. Alpha D galactopyranos. There, you heard it one more time. Okay, so work on that. Um, do not be deceived. Okay. So, chapter 5 is about stereochemistry, which has to do with molecular shapes. Uh, these, this is important in all of biology. Uh, but to appreciate uh, all of biology, we need to define some terms to begin with. But let me just show you uh, two different stereoisomers, and they happen to be molecules for which we can draw chairs, so it's kind of fun. What I'm drawing you here is um, I'm using a squiggly line to indicate that there's other stuff on the other side of that. Uh, what I'm drawing for you here is some glucose molecules that have been linked together in a particular way and this is called when you make a polymer of glucose molecules where the oxygen here is equatorial uh, at, at you know carbon 2 or wherever you want to call it uh, that's called cellulose plant cell wall fiber cellulose in contrast if we uh, change whether that group on this carbon here, these two carbons, if we change whether they are up versus down, it would be axial down here. We can leave all the other groups exactly the same. But what I am drawing for you now is something entirely different. And this is a subunit of starch, or amylose. Now compare both of those molecules. They're only different in the fact that the, the oxygen, at oxygens on, uh, on the substituent oxygens at the purple carbons are up versus down. But that has some consequences, right? 
you eat starch, we have enzymes that can break this apart into glucose. And uh, we can derive ATP from that, and then ADH and some other things. Uh, cellulose, we lack the enzyme to break apart this polymer. And it's all because of that single carbon. It makes a huge difference, all right? Uh, shape is important in biology uh, in the same way that shape is important for, say, uh, various uh, tools in your toolbox, right? The Phillips screwdriver has a different shape than the flathead, than a different shape than a hex type of screwdriver. It's all about um, having the right shape for the right function, and that's, uh, that's important in all of biology. Go ahead. Yep, it's still a down carbon. It's just the O is down axial versus up equatorial. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Question? No, I heard, thought I heard something. Guess I'm imagining. Okay. So um, these two molecules have the same connectivity. If you ask which carbon is attached to which oxygen, they're they're both the same but they have permanently different shape. Different 3D shape. Uh, and we're not just talking about rotation around carbon-carbon bonds. This is um, something we can't change by rotation. And so we're going to call those stereoisomers. They're isomers because they have the same uh, composition and same connectivity, uh, but they're stereoisomers because they have different shape. Okay, so this is, uh, you've heard of isomers before that have the same composition but different types of bonding. Uh, this is a new kind of isomer where the type, the bonding is exactly the same, only the shape is different. Okay, so we're going to, we have two flavors of stereoisomers, two and only two. Um, and category one is the small category, and that is enantiomers. All right, the definition of enantiomers are molecules that are mirror images of each other. And your text add the, adds the words non-superimposable, which is just a fancy way of saying they're mirror images of each other, but still not the same. And uh, this concept can be difficult to understand. Um, the classic example your text does, you have right in front of you, you have a right hand and a left hand. They are mirror images of each other. Nevertheless, they're not the same because you can't put them in the same place and line up everything. You could line up palm to palm, but you, and, uh, well, let's see, you can line up all the right fingers, but you can't line up the back of the hand with the other back of the hand, right? And if you try to do that, oh, now the fingers don't match. And, and you can sit and try to do that for like ever, uh, and it will never work. They are different. You. You're going to show me. Good. We'll, we'll catch you in an infinite number of years still doing it, right? Um, so in the same way, molecules can, uh, can have mirror images that are not the same as each other. And the classic situation in which this can occur is a, an sp3 hybridized carbon that is attached to four different things. So uh, I don't know that this molecule is real or stable, but uh, we're going to, it's a simple one where we're, we've got a carbon attached to four different things. We're gonna use color to emphasize the difference between these. Uh, I need something that doesn't look orange. I've already chosen blue. I guess we'll go back to our old standby pink, which actually looks purple. So now we can't use purple. Uh, um, yellow, green, uh, gray. Okay, yeah, boring but effective. So there we go. Um, 
All right, so now I'm going to draw a mirror. And this is where basically anybody who wants to talk about stereochemistry is going to try to work through the looking glass into their uh, title of their paper or the section because when uh, thinking about enantiomers, we have to be able to draw what the mirror image of this molecule to the left is. Remember, mirrors are sort of a back-to-front reflection. So whereas uh, this C-Cl bond was angled away towards our left, now it's going to be angled away towards our right, uh, and so on. Okay, so you see how those are mirror images of each other. It's okay if it's not immediately obvious. Everything on the left is a reflection of what's on the right. Okay, now in your mind, try to rearrange or just by moving the molecule around, See if you can make it look like that exactly. And, and it may be that you need a set of models to do this. Um, I'm going to try to teach you some tools to use on paper to manipulate things. So the first one is the claw. Who's in charge here? No? Okay. Toy Story, go look it up. There's little aliens and... Woody asks, who's in charge here? And they all say, the claw. All right, so hold on to that hydrogen, then spin around that bond by 180 degrees. That should, hydrogen will still be in the same place as will carbon, but chloro is going to be here. Now, as we swing around, fluoro, which was angled out toward us, should now be where? It's got to be back. Whereas bromo, which was angled back away from us, has got to be in the front. So, again, we'll uh, try to use highlighting to indicate what's where. Oops. All right. Now, see whether uh, we've, we've rearranged this molecule, so at least the, C, the H and the Cl line up, but my problem is... Now the bromine and the fluorine don't line up, okay? And so we could do that forever, and we would see that they are not the same thing, okay? Enantiomers are mirror images of each other that are not the same. These two, the relationship between these two molecules is they are enantiomers. Now, there's another term we're going to use to describe a single molecule that is not the same as its mirror image. And that word is chiral. So this molecule, and chiral is an adjective, this molecule is chiral. Part of speech, adjective. And it's an antiomer, this molecule is also chiral. Enantiomers is a noun. Enantiomers describes the relationship between two molecules. They are mirror images of each other, but are not the same as each other. Um, to ask the question, is this an enantiomer, doesn't really make sense. You have to ask, are these two things enantiomers of each other? It does make sense to ask, is this molecule chiral? Because all you need to do to determine whether it's chiral is to draw its mirror image and convince yourself that they either are the same or are not. Okay? Yes? Does chiral only refer to things that are enantiomers of each other? Does chiral refer only to things that have enantiomers? Yes. Uh, a chiral molecule must have an enantiomer because by definition it cannot be the same as its mirror image. Yeah. So CH4, if we put all of those, I'm going to ask you to sort of mentally draw the mirror image. 
that's going to be exactly the same. And yeah. CH2CL. Not chiral. Good. Uh, and sure, if you did CH2 and um, two CLs, say, oh, what do we choose for CL gray? That's very... Blue and gray, I mean, man, that sort of seems, I don't know, are those depressing colors or are those inspiring stately colors? I'm not sure. Man, why is it just, there, oh man, if you lift up the pencil too much, it starts to shade on top and then you get this weird pattern. Okay, this molecule is also not chiral. Okay, what about CH2, CL, and BR? Let's try. So uh, when in doubt, you can try to do it in your head, but when in doubt, you can always fall back to the let's draw the mirror image. So, uh, oops, I wanted, dang it, I wanted bromine to be this color. All right, so here's your mirror. Let's draw the mirror image. Okay, um, sorry, we need, it's taking forever to, <laughs> to label everything. I don't know if it's helpful or not. All right, so if we, are these the same thing? Um, to see that, there's a couple of different things you can do. Uh, one, if you decide to do the claw, um, then you would draw the new sort of, oh, whoops. We could swing everything around so now that the BR is in the front and the CL is in the back. All right, and we can now bring this over and see, is that the same? No, but what if, and um, this isn't exactly claw action. This is steering wheel action. So um, what if we put a steering wheel axis right in between the chlorine and the bromine and we rotate 180 degrees there? Doing so is going to exchange the position of the two hydrogens and is also going to exchange the position of the chloro and the bromo. And now you see it is the same thing as its mirror image. So sometimes you have to rotate and spin things around in more than one way in order to see. Okay, in this case, uh, another, so just to review, what we did in our brain is we did claw action around this carbon-hydrogen bond to get to here, but then we saw that if we took, and maybe steering wheel isn't the right analogy, maybe we're going to take um, one hand, that's a strange hand, on that chlorine, and another hand, that's another strange hand, on that bromine, and then we're going to twist. Right? That's what I just did is worse. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, right. The other thing you could have done conceptually is taken that claw up here and instead of twisting, uh, spinning around the claw, take the claw and actually pull it over like this. Tip the molecule over like that so that the, this hydrogen ends up here and that hydrogen ends up there. Chloro and bromo still stay in the right place. Okay, if some of this is hard to do, you need to get a model set and play with the models until you can figure it out, okay? Uh, but what you're seeing is, so far, as long as there are two of the same group on an sp3 hybridized carbon, 
for these simple molecules that are just C, X4, whatever X is, uh, as long as you have two things of two of the same group, that molecule, that simple molecule can't be chiral. Okay. Um, now, we're going to introduce a term that applies not only to simple molecules like this, but also to more complicated ones. And the term is useful because it helps us determine whether molecules are chiral and what the relationship between molecules is, whether they are enantiomers or some other kind of stereoisomer. And that term is stereocenter. Um, stereocenter is short for stereogenic center. Stereogenic center means um, a carbon, an sp3 hybridized carbon with four different things attached. Okay? So, uh, this carbon, I'm going to circle it in red, is a stereocenter. I should also write it in red. Oh, great question. Does it have to be carbon? Could it be like uh, a nitrogen bonded to four things? Yes. Um, uh, it can also be... Silicon. It could also be silicon. Um, I'm not going to write stereocenter over there because I don't have room. Um, just as a brief aside, I'm not sure whether your text talks about this or not. Some people ask, uh, you just asked, uh, what about a nitrogen that's attached to four different things? Um, is that a stereocenter? Uh, yes, but uh, if you're in a situation where it's going to revert back to the neutral amine, you might say, well, that nitrogen still has four different things attached, so isn't it a stereocenter? And it turns out that it's actually easy for nitrogen to do what's called pyramidalization, where it uh, swings all of those alkyl groups up and pops the lone pair down to the other side. Um, this isn't important, uh, but... Uh, Nitrogens can invert like that, and so nitrogens with three things attached in general are not chiral. Okay, um, I'm going to just sort of shrink that down as a minor point. Okay, so um, a stereocenter is a carbon, an sp3 hybridized carbon with four different things attached. Now, in the simple molecule I've drawn for you, we have one stereocenter one carbon with four different things attached, and it is chiral, all right? If you have more than one stereocenter, it might be chiral. I know you don't like that word, might, because that means there are going to be situations where a molecule has stereocenters, but is nevertheless not chiral, and that is exactly true. So, yeah, go ahead. All, that's right. All of the substituents have to be different. In other words, you can't have two of the same. Yep. So um, the carbon here, not a stereocenter. The carbon here is not a stereocenter. The carbon here is also not a stereocenter. Okay, so uh, in general, we're going to see if a molecule has one stereocenter, it must be chiral, and it will therefore have an enantiomer. If a molecule has two plus stereocenters, it might be chiral. <laughs> With a question mark. No, it might be chiral, 
uh, but beware. That's ominous. So let me show you what I mean by that. <clears throat> okay. There's a simple molecule. Let's see if it has stereocenters. To facilitate the discussion, I'm going to number the carbons. Where are my stereocenters here, if any? Two and three are stereocenters. It's true. How do you know they are stereocenters? Okay. All right. Because they are each sp3 hybridized carbons with four different things attached. Good. Uh, so, good question. Is it just the atom to which it's attached? No. It, things that are different are different all the way out. Oh, okay. So, it's the entire R group. In, in reality, you could go through, you remember how we assigned E versus Z? Mm -hmm. You can tell if two groups are different simply by that comparison. Oh, so, attached to more other stuff. Okay. Yep. Good. Good. Uh, okay. Now let me show you a slightly different molecule. Does this molecule have stereocenters? Um, no. Wait, no, yes. yes. We're committing to yes, is that right? Okay, it does indeed have stereocenters, two carbons that are attached to four different things. Um, okay, now let's ask, are they chiral? Are, are, which molecule, are, are either of these molecules chiral? And to do that, we need to draw a mirror image. So there are often, there are many ways to do this, and uh, so you have to get, and, and maybe making a model is a good way to begin. Ultimately, I found with students, if you're still using the model set on the exam, chances are you haven't put enough practice in. Uh, because what happens when you're using the model set on the exam, if you're not familiar enough with it, you actually get stressed out by plugging things together and suddenly things aren't working and, oh, I just dropped all my hydrogens and so now I'm stressed out and I'm starting to get flustered and pretty soon the SpongeBob's are running around in my brain and things are on fire. So uh, if you put in enough time working with the models ahead of time, then you can do some of these manipulations on paper and it's not, and it's not that hard. If you're going to use the models on the exam, just make sure you've practiced enough and and uh, have a containment plan for the hydrogens rolling all over the place. Uh, all right, so to see if this is chiral, what we're going to do is draw the mirror image. Um, so I'm going to actually slide this one over. We'll put a mirror here. And then I'm going to simply draw the molecule as the reflection, the OH group would be here, and another OH group would be there. Now I ask, are those the same thing? And I'm going to try to see that by spinning around. Um, Okay, if I spin around, it looks like, no, I can spin it around, but uh, it's still a mirror image. Uh, and notice that I, down here, I zag where I zig up there. So I don't, that doesn't, but you get the idea. I'm sort of going upward here or downward there. So uh, what I just did for you, uh, that manipulation was steering wheel action, where here is, um, it's not 10 and 2 anymore. It was, well, sure, fine, 10 and 2, except that's backwards. Forget it. Uh, we're spinning around 180 degrees. We're putting an axis in the middle of the molecule. We're spinning around 180 degrees. That gets us, oh dear, it doesn't want to undo all of that. 
Uh, come on. Oh, no. All right, fine. Anyway, spirit... Sp <laughs> Running out of time, and now people are anxious to go. The, so the next thing you need to do is the pancake flip. So you're going to take a molecular spatula in your mind, and um, you can embellish it with whatever colors you want. And you're going to slide that thing under the molecule, and then you're going to flip it. And I want you to do that and draw the result and see if you think it's the same or different from that molecule. Then do the same thing over here. Draw the mirror image. Over, that's supposed to be a star. Draw the mirror image over there and see if it's the same thing. Okay? And then we'll return to that discussion on Monday. Have a good weekend.